we're back in the dyno cell with Steven's E-Ray today. As we mentioned in our last video, when we tested the E-Ray, this car was headed down to Lingenfelter to get supercharged. Well, now that's done, the car's back and we're getting to see what it can do. The reason this car had to go to Lingenfelter for the install and not just get done here was because this is the very first E-Ray getting a supercharger kit. There's a lot of different things on this car that get in the way of the existing kit. So Lingenfelter needed the car in person so they could test fit everything, make adjustments to the kit and basically make their kit compatible with an E-Ray. But that's all done. We also weren't completely sure if the tuning in this car was gonna be different in a way that wouldn't allow us to tune it the same way we do with the Stingrays. But the good news is that's all the same. So the electric part of this car and the gasoline part of this car, they do talk to each other, but they must still be separate and similar enough to a Stingray that we could have this car tuned exactly like a Stingray. Now the car's back with us for lots of road testing, launches, shifting, checking the zero to 60 and all that fun stuff. We wanna make sure that the E-Ray behaves exactly the same way a Stingray does with the extra power. So far, everything is testing out really well and now we're at the point of strapping it down to the dyno and seeing what kind of power it puts down. You guys also had a lot of questions in our last video regarding dyno numbers, correction factors, so we're gonna to touch on that today to give you guys some more clarity around what all that means. All right, let's jump into the most exciting part, the numbers. If you guys watched our last video, you would have seen this car put down 573 horsepower and 630 foot-pounds of torque to all four wheels through our linked dyno jet. Now with the Lingenfelter supercharger kit installed, we're seeing 734 horsepower and 792 foot-pounds of torque. This car has a monstrous power band now with over 700 foot-pounds of torque available from basically 2,000 RPMs, carrying up to a peak at about 4,000 RPMs before it trails off a little bit. The power climbs all the way up to the 734 point just after 6,000 RPMs. You can see a little bit of a trail off on that particular run where the electric motors kind of dial back a little bit, getting ready to shift. Different runs on this car will produce different looking power curves because there are different points in which the electric motors will start to taper off on the top end. With the car back here on our dyno, we also did do some touch up on the tuning. Now it came back to us already tuned by Lingenfelter, but we want to take some data logs here on our dyno for them on the local fuel here, 93 octane, and have it touched up as needed. When we did that, we did put the car into dyno mode, which means we fix the front wheels so they can't turn the car goes into a dyno mode where it's only producing power to the rear wheels, we unlink the dyno and we measure it that way like we would on a Stingray. When we tested the calibration that was on the car, we were in the 580 to 585 range. Everything looked really good. We made some adjustments to it and we ended up at 598 horsepower and 551 torque to the rear wheels. So we have that graph on here as well to illustrate what this car produces at the gas engine. It's important to do the dyno testing and tuning with just the gas engine because as I mentioned, the electric motors can assist different ways, different times, depending on RPM, depending on the battery charge. We always start the runs from a full battery charge, but as temperatures change and everything else, there can be differences there. So we wanted to do a pure test of just the gas motor and that's what that is. Once we had the calibration all finalized, we linked the dyno back up and ran it one final time, and that's where we see the 734 horsepower and the 792 torque, with it all linked together, producing power at all four wheels. Now, as I mentioned, all these numbers that we're showing you guys are with standard correction. You guys had a lot of questions in our last video about differences in dyno numbers, even amongst other dyno jets. Now, in general, I could do a whole one hour video on dynos and corrections and different types of dynos. There's a lot to unpack there. If you guys are interested in understanding dyno numbers, do some research. There's lots of existing videos out there that can kind of help explain the differences between Mustang style dynos, hub dynos, dyno jets like we have here. For the sake of comparison, from my many years of experience of tuning, dyno jets to dyno jets are the easiest to compare. They're an inertia based dyno, which means they just spin a drum and measure how quickly it's accelerating. That makes them a lot easier to control the factors. To make the numbers comparable from location to location, DinoJet uses something called a correction factor. The point of a correction factor is to adjust for the elevation, 
the humidity, and the temperature in which you're testing. That way you can test a car here in Iowa on a super hot, humid day, or test it on a really cold day in Colorado, for example, and the car's numbers corrected should be pretty similar. The car in Colorado would be getting some adjustment for the higher elevation, but also being accounted for the cooler temperatures. Here in Iowa, we'd be getting some correction for the humid, hot weather, but we are closer to sea level, so we wouldn't have as much compensation coming from the elevation. The whole point is to level out the numbers. Now that said, there are two primarily used types of correction factor that the DinoJet offers. STD, which stands for standard, and SAE. The way these correction factors work is by adjusting the corrected numbers up or down depending on the conditions in the room. The correction factor is 1.0 for each of these types of corrections at different temperatures, pressures, and humidity in the room. The way standards numbers work, because they start from a lower point, they typically offer more correction if the conditions are even moderately warm or humid in your dyno room. SAE numbers based correction starts from higher temperatures and a bit more humidity, which means the correction that you see with SAE generally won't be as high because it starts more from what I would call average conditions. What that means is on any given day, if you run a car on the dyno, standard correction numbers are always gonna be a little bit higher than SAE numbers. Now, some shops like to do STD. We typically do STD here at our shop because it produces the largest number and our customers like large numbers. We sit here and we try to educate them as much as we can about the differences of numbers amongst dinos and everything else. At the end of the day, a lot of people just wanna see the biggest number. So we use standard. We baseline the cars in standard, we run them in standard, we tune them in standard. The gains are the relative gains. Numbers are just numbers, keep that in mind. Now, some shops like to use SAE. A primary reason for using SAE is that a lot of racing entities require SAE numbers. Anytime someone comes and uses our dyno and needs NASA qualification numbers, we switch the dyno to SAE and we run it like that and we produce those numbers. Dyno correction is always needed. You shouldn't run uncorrected numbers because you're not really getting a true comparable number that you can look at from dyno to dyno. So correction is always going to be in place, standard is going to be a little bit higher, SAE a little bit lower, but that's what the numbers mean. The important thing is to look at the baseline and then look at the gains. All right, so with all that said about correction factors, what does that mean for numbers on a car like this? Well, let's show you right now. As I mentioned, in standard correction, this car in stock form was 573 horsepower, 630 torque, tuned in two-wheel drive with a supercharger, 598 horsepower and 551 torque, tuned in all-wheel drive linked together with the electric motors, 734 horsepower and 792 foot-pounds of torque. So now let's switch the dyno over to SAE and I'll show you guys how these numbers change. Okay, so now the same runs with SAE correction applied, we're seeing a baseline of 560 horsepower and 616 torque. We're seeing a new two-wheel drive power level with, this, with the supercharger on here of 587 horsepower and 541 torque and Combined together, electric and gas, we're seeing 721 horsepower and 778 torque. So as I mentioned, the numbers are always a bit lower with SAE correction, but they don't go down by 100 or 50 or anything crazy. It's a small drop from standard numbers. We're still producing a ton of power with this car. So that's it for the E-Ray today with a supercharger on it. Hope you guys enjoyed this. Hope you guys found the dyno stuff educational, maybe answered some more of your questions there. Stay tuned for more exciting content on Steven's E-Ray.